All right, here we go. This is the artist formerly known as James Smith. He says, hello, James Smith here from Indianapolis. So, Neil, can't we agree that it's Brian Greene's fault that the universe will not end in fire but in ice? He's supposed to be figuring out what's causing the expansion of the universe. Or do we need to let him off the hook and become a level three civilization on the Kardashev scale to do that? Love you guys and have a great day. Man, he's he's calling out Brian Green. Yeah, I'll tell you, he's. I don't know what you, I don't know what Brian did to you, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we the expansion of the universe derives initially from the Big Bang, but there's also this dark energy phenomenon in the vacuum of space that is accelerating the expansion of the universe against the wishes of gravity. All the collective gravity of all the galaxies in the universe, even the dark matter, what we call dark matter, because that has gravity, all of that wants to slow down the universe and maybe one day recollapse us. However, we have a dark energy phenomenon going on that is accelerating the expansion of the universe, and we don't know what's causing it, we don't understand it, we want to, and you can't blame Brian, Brian Greene for that. <laughs> and as we expand, the temperature of the universe drops, Hence the, the notion, the universe, you know. At, so Chuck, ask, how will the universe end? Neil, how will the universe end? Not in fire, but in ice. Yes. Right. So, yeah, don't, you can't blame Brian Greene. He's, don't, don't shoot the messenger there, because we need the messengers. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> now, about the level three civilization. Uh, so let's remind people that there is a, was he a physicist, a Kardashev, no, no relation to Kim. <laughs> to Kardashians, <laughs> okay. So Kardashev imagined, not imagined, he, he thought about and wrote about levels of civilization measured not by how smart you are, not by how nice you are, but by what means of energy do you command, Ooh. do you control. Wow. Okay. And a level one civilization controls all the energy manifesting on your home planet. So that would okay. be like the hurricanes and the tornadoes and the earthquakes and the tides. We would somehow find a way to tap that energy. And harness our, it. To harness it for our own means, for our own diabolical, <laughs> for our own means. That'd be a level one civilization. A level two would capture all the energy from its host star. We capture some of it with our like solar panels on the roof or whatever. Right, exactly. But sunlight is hitting every square inch of Earth's surface. Okay. Where, well, when it's not hitting our surface, it's hitting the tops of clouds. But Earth is intersecting a cross section of the sun's energy that would otherwise go into empty space, but Earth was in the way. Right. Okay. Well, how about that same amount of energy that went by Earth? and went above and below in every other direction in space. That's a lot of sunlight. So if you build a system where you capture all that energy of your host star, channel it down to your civilization, now you have a badass civilization level two. Wow, that's, that's level two? That's only level two, right. And I think, uh, yeah, level two. And now you build a similar device that captures all the energy of all the stars in your galaxy. Okay. That'd be a level three. And a level four would be all the energy of all the galaxies of all the universe. That'd be level four. And there's a level five, I think. Yeah, that's called God. <laughs> God, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <That's Yeah. laughs> God on the Kardashian that, scale. That's it, God on the Kardashian <laughs> scale. That's all there is to it. That's so, crazy. Do we command the energy of hurricanes or tornadoes or no? We run away from them. We buy, you know, toilet paper and run away from earthquakes and tornadoes and 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 volcanoes. And so we're not even at level one civilization, so we're level zero. Look at that. Yeah, we're at number zero. <laughs> yeah. So if we control all the energy of all the universe, maybe even the dark energy then we can control the expansion of the universe. Right. For, for our own needs, for our own desires. Yeah, that's too much power for anybody to have, especially <laughs> us. No, no, but that'd be the future where you have wars between 
the universe is in the multiverse. That's true. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not joining that army. I don't care. <laughs> I'm not doing it. But at that point, all the life forms in our universe would be uh, aligned with each other because our enemies would be whole other universes if we're all level four civilizations. Yeah, but, you know, the way it normally works is you're working with the people to defeat a common enemy while you're plotting to destroy them as soon as you defeat the common enemy. That's... <laughs> That's the playbook. That's yeah. the playbook, you know? So, yeah. The human playbook. Yeah. But yeah. here would be interesting. You know how to mess with another universe? If you have the power, maybe level five power, to change the laws of physics. Okay, see, you're, see now you're just diabolical. <laughs> no, no, think. Because if you just slightly change the charge on the electron, then all solid matter would just, de would just uh, disassemble. Oh, Oh, you, you just thanos a whole universe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's crazy. That's, yeah. that's insane. I, by the way, I don't generally have those. I'm a peaceful person. This is the, the, the <laughs> that question drove me to these insane thoughts. Yes. So, Chuck, time for two or three more. So, what do you have? All right. Here we go. This is Isabella. She says, hi, Dr. Tyson and Lord Nice. Uh, Isabella and Sierra from Ogden, Utah. Our question is, what would our solar system look like if we had an extra planet, uh, either terrestrial or gaseous? And what would the implications of this be? Can a planet that can't be demoted, RIP Pluto, uh, 1930 to 2006, Thanks to Leo Tyson. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Implicate me that way. I was yeah. an accessory. I was not, I didn't pull the trigger. All right. So anyway. But I did drive um, the getaway car. I did drive the getaway true. car. Um, mm -hmm. So Planet X, I mean, every. No, no I, so a I, couple I kinda, things. I kind of feel like we get this in the news no, every I got once this. in Here a while. Go. Okay. Here's a, my colleague who, works just up on the sixth floor of the row center. My office is on the fifth floor, which is not where I am right now. I'm in a hotel in, in Los Angeles. Uh, Steve Soder, who, by the way, co-wrote the original Cosmos with Carl Sagan and the first of my two Cosmoses. He co-wrote those, okay? Wow. Brilliant guy. Uh, brilliant in history and science, and, and he's fundamentally a solar system guy. He wrote a research paper that demonstrated that the planets we now have, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, in their locations is the maximum number of planets you can fit into the orbital space of this solar system. If you put another planet in of any size, Jupiter-like or otherwise, the, the, the gravitational fields of the other orbiting planets would wreak havoc on its orbit and it would either crash into a pre-existing planet, crash into the sun, or be ejected from the solar system. Thrown out. Thrown out. You. So we are, we are so mature as a system, four and a half billion years, five billion years old, that all the shaken out that was gonna happen has happened in the solar system. Gotcha. So if we're going to find another planet, it would have to be way beyond Neptune, right. where there isn't this orbital dynamics creating the, the stability zones of what we now accept as the eight-planet solar system. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. So it's all about the pulling and the tugging. And that yeah. ours, this is ours, happening at all times. It's always happening. So ours is done. All the pulling and the tugging, is, is it is what it is. Yeah, this, we, there's some long-term instabilities, uh, we think, uh, like on billions of years time scales, but by and large, we're stable. And it would go unstable if you just brought in another planet. Nice. So all, all the searching for another planet, uh, planet nine, planet X, that's all happening beyond, well beyond uh, even deep into the Kuiper belt. Right, right, yeah. it would have to. Okay, very cool, man. What I love that question, that yeah, was good. This is aspiring scientific journalist also, a cow who writes, that, that was the title there, it says, 
If I rotate a proton fast enough, can I create a black hole? And if so, let's assume I spin it to create an event horizon of one meter or one kilometer. How could a Hawking radiation dissolve it? Or will it just go all at once? Where does the spin go? And I'm going to put on the end of that, my man. You need to get some help for your drug problem. Okay. It's, it's all fun and games until somebody blows out a mind. And a mind is a terrible thing to waste, sir. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> okay. I have to reassemble the bits and pieces of that question into a question that has sort of physical meaning and coherence. So just because you spin something has nothing to do with whether it becomes a black hole. They're right. unrelated. It's, it's all about mass. Mass. It's mass, all about mass. mass. Right. It's all about mass. That's A. B, a proton is not a fundamental particle. Okay? A proton is composed of quarks. And so, so let's create that question, reassemble that question in a way that has meaning. If a, a black hole is evaporating by Hawking radiation, and let me remind people, the gravitational field just outside the event horizon has enough energy to spontaneously create particles, a matter-antimatter pair. And one particle drops into the black hole, the other one escapes. Where did this mass come from? It came from the gravitational field of the black hole. And the gravitational field comes from all the mass that is the black hole. Damn. Bro, this is a way, I don't, this is the way that the matter that's inside, <laughs> What Chuck? Chuck. <laughs> it's so freaking creepy, man. <laughs> this is how black holes evaporate. It's crazy. Yes. It's yes. crazy. You have no idea, people. Okay. And the and the weird thing is, for me, because I I this was a an emergent phenomenon that I then learned from my colleagues who work in this space, that if you inventory the particles that show up in the from the evaporated gravitational field, it is the same inventory of particles that the black hole ate over its entire life. Uh, okay, uh, so somehow the gravitational field remembered what the black outside the event horizon that's remembered insane. what got eaten and is living inside the event horizon. So, oh, wait a minute. I just, okay. So could that mean that maybe when the stuff falls in, the information stays at the event horizon? Yeah, well, so this is the idea of, this is the holographic universe that people are talking about, that the event horizon is an imprint of all information that had passed through that, that boundary. I, All the information I, is contained. I'm, I don't. I don't know what to believe anymore in anything. I'm. <laughs> hold on. Hold. I'll be right back. I'm. Wait, uh, no, where you I, go? I, <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay. All right. The, yes, these are edibles. Damn it. That's what they are. <laughs> you just went and got edible. I just went and got myself an edible, and uh, yeah, <laughs> that's insane. What's <laughs> okay, so now here's what's going on. In the original Hawking radiation paper, what he was able to show is that the light that is, the, the particle comes out, but the, you, can, you can associate a temperature of the black hole. Okay. okay. Based on, and temperatures, if you add a temperature, you radiate. Okay? Right. So he was able to analogize the evaporation of a black hole with a black hole of a certain temperature that's radiating. Okay. Wow. So, as the black hole gets smaller and smaller, the radiative light, the wavelength gets smaller and smaller, and the wavelength is commensurate with the size of the black hole. Okay? The, that's the wavelength of light that's coming out of the system. Right. So, as the black hole gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the wavelength of light gets tinier and tinier okay. and tinier. And when you have tiny wavelengths of light, that light has higher and higher energy. Energy. Right. Energy. So you go from visible light to ultraviolet light, 
which will mess with your, your, you know, your skin, to X-rays, which will mess with your DNA, to gamma rays, turn you into the Hulk, okay? So what he showed was that as the black hole evaporates, it evaporates faster and faster, and the energy level of light that it emits gets higher and higher and higher, and it eventually, it's a runaway process, and it's just a, an, a, a brief pop of light of pure gamma rays, and then the black hole is completely disappeared. Gone. Gone. So my point is, if you still like your proton, your proton is composed of quarks, that's what's fundamental, okay? And so as the, as the black hole is evaporating and, and you're holding on to your wrath proton and its quarks, I'm saying that's the last one, you know, sh sh turn, turn off the lights when you leave, all right? And it'll just evaporate back into our universe. Crazy. Wow. Thank you.